So we're going to start. Welcome, everybody, to the last session, the final session of the day. And congratulations to being awake, because we're going to talk about fatigue. Um, me and Barbara, living with autoimmune, we definitely know what fatigue is. But we're going to start um, this session by listening to Nancy. And Nancy Redfern is a consultant anesthetist. <laughs> yeah from Newcastle, UK. She's co-chair of Joint Fatigue Working Group Association of Anesthetists yes. Europe. Yeah. I've worked on that all afternoon, so I'm so happy <laughs> yeah. I did it. Uh, so, Nancy, Barbara, you want to tell me who you are before we I want to jump off the stage? Right. <laughs> well, yes, my name is Barbara Bohannon, and I'm very honored to be here today. I worked within patient advocacy for very many years, and I'm today the coordinator for healthcare and policy and research at the Swedish Psoriasis Association. And as Jenny mentioned, yes, I do have an autoimmune disease since I was five years old, and I know everything about fatigue. So, Nancy, you're going to have to be very vivacious today, <laughs> together with our distinguished panel that we will be talking to later on. So, Jenny, and how about you? Who are you? Yeah, who am I? Well, my name is Jenny. I'm not organized as Barbara in an organization. I'm totally unorganized. I'm more of a patient activist, but I've had the pleasure of working together with Panilla and Matthias on putting this post uh, Focus Patient together this year. And now we're going to take you through, through the final sessions. But first, Nancy, the stage is yours. Take it away. So, thank you very much. Many thanks for the invitation. Um, as I say, I, my contributions are about fatigue. And I used to think it was just an occupational hazard, but I gradually come to realize that it has really important impacts both on patient safety and on our own as healthcare workers, uh, both safety and well being. Now, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. This is a circadian nadir. Some of you have travelled a long way. If you feel you'd just like to shut your eyes, uh, we'll wake you up again in 20 minutes. So, what I'm going to do is describe some of the impacts fatigue has on our performance at work, tell you a little bit about the story of the Fight Fatigue campaign and the way we're trying to change the culture in the UK to recognise this, and to think about the way patients and industry can help, uh, to help us perhaps to achieve this together. My interest in this started oh, about six years ago. I was talking to the chair of the National Group of Trainees in Anesthesia, asked him what sort of week he'd had, as you do. Tragically, he'd spoken at his colleague's funeral. A lovely man who had done three night shifts, there was a bed to sleep in, he just wanted to get home to his wife, who was seven and a half months pregnant. He'd done the journey lots of times before, knew he was tired, wound the car window down, put his phone on loud speaking, and he was singing to her when this happened. A personal tragedy. She was a widow when she gave birth. That child never met Dad. But I was the membership secretary at the Association of Anesthetists at the time. To me, this was a completely unnecessary death. Something had to be done. And as we started to read round this, we realised Ronnie wasn't the only person to die driving tired. Every six months, every year, a doctor, a nurse, a midwife, somebody else died driving tired. Why was this? Well, we think it's a thing called a micro-sleep, where somebody just loses their, their kind of, they don't respond for, to their surroundings just for a few seconds. It's actually a sign of sleep deprivation, but the person doesn't realise they're doing it. That is a, a junior doctor, Sam, who went straight from a night shift to an advanced driving school where she did a 20-minute simulation. Look at her. She's got no muscle tone in her face. Her eyelids are drooping, yawning. The rest of us recognise this. And we think that that's what goes wrong, and that's why people crash. So, were these just rare, dreadful, random accidents, 
or was there something uh, going on that we needed to get hold of? So we decided that the first thing we'd do was a survey. And we did a survey of all the trainees in anaesthetics in UK. Anaesthetics um, is anaesthesiology, I think, over here. But we, we haven't got quite enough lip movement to get that said. Um, so these are doctors, junior doctors in anaesthesia. And of course, as soon as we published that, the consultants said, well, me too. So we surveyed them. And you can see here, 57, well, you might not be able to, I don't think the pointer's working, but somewhere up there, 57% of uh, trainees and 45% of consultants had had an accident driving home or a near miss. Three quarters of them drive by car or motorbike. And look, 84% of the trainees said that they were too tired to drive, but they did so anyway because there was nowhere to rest. When the European Time Directive came in, they, um, the hospital managers thought, you're doing 12-hour shifts, not 24 hours. You don't need an on-call room. And they went on a land grab and took those uh, on-call rooms and made them into offices. So we've got lots of things going on there. Later, one of my colleagues in nursing, she did, um, a, did a survey and found that the nurses, um, that the results there were, were pretty similar. So we knew we'd got a big problem. But actually, it's not just about driving home. Fatigue has impacts on the way um, on our clinical performance at work, and it also has impacts on us as individuals. There are some there's some clear evidence of health in night shift workers. The first thing to go is empathy, which is wearing thin after about 12 hours then it becomes much harder to do logical reasoning. Vigilance, which is really important in anaesthesia, becomes more variable. And we lose the intellectual flexibility to make those quick decisions you need to in the middle of the night in fast-changing situations. Our ability to take in new information and to learn goes down. Um, and our psychomotor performance is worse, so putting drips in and lines becomes much more difficult. Our mood gets worse, so of course our teamwork suffers. So really, everything to do with patient care gets worse the more tired we are. But it, the impacts on us as well, as well as being more accident prone, night shift workers have a higher rate of heart attacks, hypertension, strokes, um, some types of cancer, uh, breast, bowel, prostate cancer. They're all more common in night shift workers. Uh, I've put peptic alteration, but actually the top 10 most common diseases are all more common in night shift workers. And there's an increasing re recognition of the impact of fatigue on psychological health, uh, depression, suicide, suicide amongst um, healthcare workers. This has been known for years in industry. And the dangers of working at night, at every other safety critical industry has a proper fatigue risk management system as part of the legal requirements. So all those uh, safety critical industries, nuclear, petrochemical, airline that Sven was talking about, they all have to have fatigue risk management as part of their um, legal requirements for functioning. That's not because they know more about sleep physiology. It's because they've had some spectacularly horrendous accidents. Um, we could look at the Exxon Valdez, the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, Chernobyl, um, the Challenger uh, crash, countless rail, tram, airline crashes, road crashes. They all have a fatigue element behind them. So why aren't there the same fatigue risk management systems in healthcare? Well, two things, I think. First of all, I don't think we recognise it, and therefore we take no notice of it. And the other is that, of course, when people die driving home, it's one crash in the local newspaper. It's not a big, spectacular thing. 
But it's been recognised for a hundred years. Maslow pointed out that if you want to have a system where people feel respectful among, uh, with each other and to patients, they're innovative, collaborative, um, creative, up here, you have to first look after people's physiological needs. And sleep is right down at the bottom in the red with eating, drinking, going to the loo. I put patients to sleep for a living, and in my curriculum, there is nothing about sleep. So that actually needs to be addressed. Really, only when you've addressed the basic physiological needs are you going to be able to do something about creating an, the right environment for good health care to uh, go on. And look at this, a study of almost three million patients. Um, and they looked at whether you had your operation in hours or you know, out of hours after 8 o'clock at night or during the day at weekends. And the odds ratio of an unexpected death in loads of different surgery put together was 1.47. So there's something going on. And these were all very well controlled. You, uh, the patient and um, surgical characteristics don't explain this. So it must be us. So we knew we'd got a problem. We could see that there is something that needs addressing. So what did we do with the Fight Fatigue campaign? Well, in education, we started off by thinking, we're right at the bottom here. We, people need to know about it. And in education, you have to know the facts, then you have to know how to apply them. Then you have to demonstrate that you can do them. But it's only after you do it automatically, just as part of the culture and the way you do it here, that the thing becomes embedded. So we seem as though we've got a long way to go. And actually, as we've heard today, Managing change is really difficult for all of us. We have hundreds of ideas buzzing around the back of our heads. But it's only when you get a sense of urgency do you start and look for remedies, realise that some things, uh, you know, some, some solutions are going to have disadvantages, weigh up the choices. And that decision to act, it's not just intellectual, it's emotional as well. And actually, we, in a way, because poor Ronnie had died and he was one of us, that really focused people's minds on getting something done. So we started the Fight Fatigue campaign and we got a set of these infographics that you can see there. Um, they're available in, um, in English, but um, in, in Portuguese. I'm quite pleased about that. Um, randomly, actually, to be honest. Um, uh, in, in Polish and in German. And we've got a Creative Commons license, so please take them, please use them. I'll give you the uh, QR code to get a hold of them. Uh, what did we do where I work? Well, we, we did lots of teaching and we do lectures, but mostly we do workshops because that engages people and they think a bit more about it. Um, and then we hung them up where we thought people might read them, so they're in the changing rooms. They were on the back of the loo doors, and then we realised that half the people weren't reading them. Um, we had to put them at the right height for that. So, a um, bit of learning for us. There are things you can do about fatigue during the night. And this comes from uh, the American Air Force. Uh, they lost more they lost a lot of squaddies in the Vietnam War because the helicopter pilots had micro-sleeps. Um, and they did this work and they discovered that if you had a short 20-minute, uh, they called it a power nap, it's part of being macho, you know. Um, uh, they, they, you had that, uh, but you had to have 15 minutes to go to sleep. And the advice was, have some coffee first because you'll metabolise the caffeine and it'll wake you up um, 20 minutes later. I think if you're a certain age, your bladder wakes you up, but we'll perhaps gloss over that. They don't stop you, they don't make it easy to do logical reasoning, but they actually stop the microsleeps, particularly if you, if you have your power nap in the early part of the night. Here's a good study from uh, a professor in nursing from Wisconsin. Um, it's got a bit of science in it, so uh, wish me luck. So, 
in the top, the, the top group is a group of people who were asked uh, six different teams to just carry on working normally and have a night shift without a power nap. The bottom are the nurses who had, uh, there were six t different teams in that, uh, and they had a power nap. Now, a little bit of physiology. All the while we're awake, in the very top of the top of this, and I've got no idea where the pointer is, we, all the while we're awake, we produce substances called somnogens that make us think, oh, you better have a rest. And the more you have, the more tired you get counteracting that during the day there's the circadian alerting system from light but you see in that dark part of the graph as soon as it goes dark that just switches off and so you stop um, you, you just feel this overwhelming urge to sleep but look what happened in the red when these nurses got a bit of a power nap their, uh, their level of wakefulness went up a bit they didn't have car crashes driving home and they were more empathic. But bottom line, do you remember how Neelam said 50% of um, medical errors are drug errors? These nurses made fewer drug errors in the middle of the night. So this was really worth doing. So we found out that actually there's something you can do about it. But of course, if there are no rest facilities, that's hopeless. So we d found out what you can do about that. So in my hospital, we bought those sofas that turn into beds. And in some of the more moneyed hospitals, they have these proper sleep pods. And our Royal College asked us to design, um, and we've got three sets of standards, and again, they're available on the website. Um, and so when the hospital's inspected, you get the, uh, you, you um, scored against whether you have a positive attitude and resources and things. But actually, it was, and, and then we discovered, we looked into measuring um, how individuals can measure uh, their, their sleep. Um, and there's the Karolinska and there's another one, um, uh, sleep scoring system. We found a nice Fitbit that attaches to an app, which I'll show you in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, we've got a very good audit tool where you can audit the rotor. And at the moment, we've launched it in July. Um, we've got about 40% of, of the hospitals in the UK have, um, has answered that. But actually, the real change has been uh, with the fight fatigue, having a campaign. I've never been involved in a campaign before. It's not what you do in anaesthetics. You sit there quietly watching the surgery and wondering if they can tell the time of the year or the time of the day. Um, and actually looking after patients and just being very vigilant and watching the whole thing go on. So with the campaign, we could make statements and we could go and see people who weren't to do with anaesthesia or medicine. The General Medical Council, who are our regulators, uh, ask now, uh, due to our campaign, ask questions every year, both of the trainers and the trainees, as to um, where whether they're getting whether they've got facilities and what the attitude is to re night shift rest and we went off to see um some mps um that's me in in parliament that's us meeting uh, the shadow minister of health um at that time but everything changes in politics so often in the in in, in britain we have to go every week i think to get that job done the top um, left hand, that's my colleague, Ruma Crossan. Um, and you can see her down there advising the Scottish Government about this. And you know, they adopted it as Scottish Government policy. And we won the British Medical Journal's um, Team of the Year as well. So we were kind of making some progress. We've also done a bit of work with our Department of Transport. Um, about 40,000 people have accidents driving, what they call driving for work. That's lorry drivers and you know, uh, taxi drivers and people whose job is driving for work. 
they want to change so that driving to and from work becomes driving for work. And that would mean that your employer was interested if you'd had an accident driving to work or had an accident driving from work. I don't know where they'll get to, but it's worth a, worth a punt. We're also working with the uh, UK's healthcare um, service uh, safety inve investigation branch, and they're like the air accident investigation branch, and the rail uh, people. They were a bit shocked, you know, to discover that we don't have fatigue risk management as part of healthcare. And they're currently trying out some questions so that when they do investigations, they ask about fatigue um, and looking for a sentinel case to write a big report. Where I work, of course, I was doing all these national lectures, I thought I'd get a grip and do something in my own place. Uh, so on the Labour Ward, we got a group of nurses and doctors and midwives and he healthcare assistants and everybody we could. And we established a fatigue risk management system, which has got predictive, proactive and reactive things. Um, I've shown you we've got those beds. This is this um, Fitbit that's attached to an app. Green, you're all right. Yellow, you, uh, actually it's from lorry drivers, you'd be between two and t five times more likely to crash your lorry. Red, you'd be more than five times more likely to crash your lorry. And what happens is that the nurses and the midwives have thought, ooh, better do something about that. So they take much more notice in having sleep between night shifts. What it really showed was actually you don't have to get more staff, that there are things you can do during the night, making sure that the workload isn't too heavy, that if there's a lot of intellectual thinking, everybody joins in, that you've got somebody experienced. When you're experienced, you don't need as much headspace to make complex decisions, and so you need support. So those sort of things can be done anywhere, anytime. And now, hooray, we're collaborating with the European Sa Patient Safety Foundation. And they've, um, uh, you can see here, they're looking at this in terms of um, patient safety in Europe and to support and reinforce to get some national fight fatigue campaigns going, integrate them, um, increase the visibility of this as a problem in healthcare and lead advocacy. And they've got this set of specific goals, I've cheekily put another one on the bottom. I think if we can encourage and support advocacy from patients, imagine, you know, the airline pilot who asks, when did you last have a power nap? You know, that's more, that's got more influence than us as, as doctors and nurses and midwives and people trying to encourage folk. This is from one of my great colleagues who works on this as well, who's a sleep physician and an anaesthetist. You can measure road traffic accidents. You can measure the number of people leaving. You can measure suicide. But you know how it's so important to measure everything. None of this bottom lot gets measured and measured against fatigue. So there's a whole lot we can do to try and help get the idea of let's make sure that the staff are not fatigued um, to make the whole of healthcare better. So there we are. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to be working in Europe and with people. It doesn't matter whether you're an airline pilot, a lorry driver, a nuclear worker, a healthcare worker. We've all got the same physiology, and I think we all need the same attention to fatigue risk management. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And if anybody was thinking about a power nap, no, not now. You can do it later. We're not done yet, right? We're most definitely not done yet. And Nancy, actually, would you mind staying up here on yes, stage right. for awesome. our panel? And while our eminent panel comes up here, I would like everyone to just stand up. There you go. Oh, you're still awake. Great. <laughs> now we just do a little neck roll. That's right. And then up with the shoulders. High, 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 high. And down with the shoulders. And up. 
and down, and neck roll again. Great. And then you go, <sighs> no, that was lousy. One more time. <sighs> Come on, you can do better. I want to hear you. One more time. <sighs> oh, that awesome. is absolutely awesome. lovely. And actually, Dr. Cox, you're not going to escape. We need Come you on. up here we as well. We need you up here now. Yes. Yeah, oh, no, you're no, 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 no. You can do that later. Not now. Not now. So, great. Now you can sit down. Thank you for participating and thank you for staying awake. I don't think we can. <laughs> so, please take your place at the table. We have a huge panel here today, so. <laughs> and eminent experts, of course. So, I would like to start with introducing everyone. And, well, Nancy, she's already introduced herself, more or less. <laughs> thank you for staying on. Uh, with us today, we have a patient advocate extraordinaire, Michaela Udemir. She is the president of the Swedish Asthma and Allergy Association, and she's also the chair of the ELF Patient Advisory Committee. Thank you for being here today, Michaela. And next to her, we have Dr. Magnus Saxon, who is a general practitioner, and he is also the president of the Swedish College of General Practitioners. Thank you for coming. And then moving on to Portugal. <laughs> I believe, yes. <laughs> Pedro Vieira dos Santos, who is the Respiratory Interventions Commercial Director, oh my lord, <laughs> of Medtronic in Portugal, and also a member of the EU PSF board. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And then we have a person of authority, we will have to say then, of course, with Dr. Bruno Siegler. And why I say that is because he is actually a medical officer at the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare which is our largest and one of our most important health care authorities in Sweden, absolutely. But you are also a medical doctor in internal medicine as well. And then, thank you for joining us up here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Eva Hardcox, you have been the chair of the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care at the Technical University of Munich for more than 23 years. And you also actually helped start the European Patient Safety Foundation, once upon a time. And currently, you are the vice president of it in its relaunched form. So, wow, now we've gone through all the introductions. And we have one pertinent question to ask each and every one of you. Now, what we're going to do that is a bit different today is actually that Michaela. Come over here. We want join you to us. come over here and join us. Because what we want our panelists to do today is they're going to answer this very important question, each and every one, and then Michaela, she is going to comment on your answers from the Ooh. patient perspective, because that is why we are here today. Focus patient, we're focusing on the patients. So what we're here to listen to are the experts, and we are here as the patient representatives to hear what you say, and either his or this. We'll see where we end up. <laughs> Jenny? Yes, so what was the question then that we asked you? We put you in a bit on the spot. So the question that everybody's going to answer and Mikael is going to reflect on is, how do we affect real and lasting change to ensure the health and safety of both HCPs and patients rather than keep trying to mend a broken system? So, anyone's up to start or are we just going to pick one? Oh, maybe we should just pick one. Mm, yeah, you do that. Okay, well, let me see. I think we'll ask Bruno first. <laughs> um, okay, hello. Do you hear me? Uh, very nice to be here and very nice to be a part of this panel uh, with these extinguished uh, guests. Uh, okay, uh, from an uh, authority point of view, uh, what, what we can look forward to, and uh, the situation for me personally here is that I have many hats. Uh, I have the authority hat that you put on. I also have the experience from emergency and ambulance care uh, from a regional uh, hospital point of view. And I also have the experience for myself as a patient. Uh, and I would say, uh, I would, if, I, if I can divide the answer in three parts, um, there, will, there will be, uh, uh, from the authority point of view, I think it would be very uh, nice. My biggest hope is that the collaboration uh, that uh, uh, has been uh, established during the last years around the national 
action plan for patient care with the National Board of Health and Welfare and, and collaborate in collaboration with other authorities and stakeholders. I really w would like to see uh, that uh, remain and evolve because I think that uh, what this has done is create a kind of epicenter uh, around the theme and uh, uh, discussion of patient safety questions from a national point of view and I really think that could be a clue uh, for uh, forthcoming work. And uh, connecting to, to your ex excellent speech, Nancy, uh, I also think that uh, this um, epicenter could very well be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, constitution of taking care of new instructions from European level regarding, for example, fatigue to establish uh, that in, in a Swedish context. So I think that this structure that has been established during the last year, I would really like to see that remain and evolve. Uh, and I'll, if I change hats and put on my uh, experience from managing uh, uh, emergency and ambulance care, I think the great uh, challenge is to uh, find a way of integrating those different perspectives that you also mentioned. Uh, we're, we're talking about patient safety, talking about uh, working conditions and so forth. And um, uh, the, the great bosses I've seen have the, 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 the ability to uh, integrate those uh, very, very important aspects in their leadership. And I would really like to see uh, those kind of integrated uh, leadership uh, evolve. Uh, and from a third point of view, uh, for the thing that I'm really uh, uh, interested in, uh, the question of patient involvement and rel relative involvement in all the levels of healthcare. Um, I think uh, we've had so many interesting discussions about uh, how to uh, involve patients uh, in our uh, work at every level of the healthcare, but uh, we, uh, I think we're quite past that part now because we know how to do it and the next thing is, is to do it. And I think that's not a question of methods in the first place, it's very much a question of attitude. I really think and hope that all of us being here meeting in this kind of constellations uh, have the uh, responsibility actually to uh, go out to our uh, own organizations to uh, actually imply, uh, implement uh, what, we're, what we're talking about here. So, uh, a long answer in three parts, but uh, that would be uh, my uh, dream. Thank you. Thank you so much. You'll have to hand over the microphone. Unfortunately, we didn't have many microphones no, today, so... <laughs> Michaela? <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. Uh, my first question was actually, have you involved patients already in the two first stages that you mentioned? Uh, engaged? Oh, yeah. I said it in Swedish, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, if I, if I start with the second part, my experience from managing emergency care, yes, we, that was one of our um, ideas of how to uh, evolve emergency care, to take in the patient's points of view. But uh, we were young, I would say, and naive, and we didn't have the real methods to, to do that, but I think it's a question of attitude and trying to find uh, the, the, the ways to get the patient's opinions in, and also be ready to handle it, because it's not always what you expect them to mm. tell you mm. that's coming, and you must be mm. open and ready to uh, handle, mm. even though those, com those mm. comments that are not align in line with your uh, uh, picture of, of your organization. And secondly, uh, on authority level, I think so uh, social students and National Board of Health and Welfare are we're, we're, we're trying. We have. Uh, number of uh, examples of how we have done to introduce and include patients and relatives in our work but there's still not much to do, much more to, to, to do and we have some other fellow authorities around us that have come even fu even further in this work and I think we have much to learn from from them thank you <clears throat> and it makes me very happy because yes what you describe is I had another session and we were and, and the healthcare professional was describing to me how the work was done and how it worked for patients and I said, well, it sounds perfect, but it's not the reality. So this is also why it's good to have the patient view. And I liked very much also what you said, Nancy, about uh, the, the, this involvement to work together because it, we shouldn't have a competition. Fatigue affects us also as patients, not only the doctors. So if we go hand in hand and talk to the authorities, to the politicians, that can make a change. Great comment, thank you so much. I think we can pass it on to Dr. Cox here, as you were 
developing the European Patient, European Patient Safety Foundation. What would be your take on this now? How to involve patients, as you said, and, and from the question that Jenny asked earlier. Well, actually, there are so many topics to be addressed. I cannot, of course, not comment on everything. Um, personally, I have an overview on uh, the medical business as a doctor for more than 40 years, and I must say, the topic, the environment of patient safety has changed a lot, but not over 30 years, it was done in the last five to 10 years. And so we're, we are still learning as a system, as a, a healthcare system, as a business, how to interpret patient care. Actually, the problem is that we don't have a definition, a real strong definition on patient safety. Uh, everybody who is involved in the, in the medical system, as a nurse, as a doctor, as a patient, as an administrator, has a different view. And this has, has to be aligned to be really sure that we all do the best in terms of the caring for the individual patient. We as a group, at a, at a, as a healthcare group, think as a collective treat treating this patient safety. But the individual patient asks you also what, what means this for, for us. And this has to be addressed very uh, anonymously in the, in, in the future. And to do this, of course we all have to work together, but how do we work together and what are the limits on working together? There are financial problems, there are cultural problems, there are many other problems. And we have to be aware that it's not we all, we all think we do the best for the patient, you know. Everybody says, okay, I'm a doctor, I treat my patients individually, and, but the outcome is clear, it's not always the best we can do as a system. So I think in addition to our efforts individually, as doctor, nurse, administrator, patient, we also have to implement uh, a culture in the medical school system. I think patient safety should be a topic uh, for students as well, to bring this, to develop this in the future. And um, we all have to think about how we can approach the contributor, our colleagues, to be aware of what we are doing in terms of patient safety. And let me just ask you a provocative question at the end. Can patient safety change into patient harm as well? We also have a legal problem. Thank you so much. Michaela, comment? <laughs> First of all, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I do agree with you that you, you, of course you want the best to help us. That's of course. Of course it could maybe do harm. You don't know. It's, it's also about ethical things. So there are many aspects to thinking of it, but um, I think I'll hand over to you now. <laughs> Just a question, what do you think about the, the including patient safety in the medical education? Yes, yeah, that, that, yeah. No. the key word here is education. In all levels, we all need, and I know one of the doctors said before that she wanted to have uh, education more often. And I think this is necessary because here in Sweden is quite unique. We and Malta are the only countries in Europe that doesn't have this. So I really hope, so education. Continued medical education. Okay, so let's go over to Dr. Isakson here, I think, for, for a comment from the floor. <laughs> yeah, from the floor, thank yeah. you. A lot of uh, interesting and good opinions here. I think for the patient safety and the healthcare personal safety in the primary care, I think that in Sweden we have gone too much towards us too specialized and too fragmentized system and we are very bad at involving patients in decision making and so and I think the best thing would be that every person in Sweden had a general practitioner and that that general practitioner had a limited amount of patients and we could be the real patient pal that we talked about earlier and we could be the patient's advocate and also when we talked about mistakes and so I think that Unfortunately, the best way for us to learn is when we do, we do a mistake and when the patient gets back to us, we have to discuss that and explain why did it go wrong and we can find a way together. But if you see different patients all the time as a GP, 
they don't get back to you and you don't learn what you what you did wrong so i think we should be like a more human uh, uh, health care and not so much only flow charts and uh, and so of course we need like decision support and flow charts and so but we need we also need this um, that you look at the human as a whole and that we have these personal relations then I think uh, it would be much better both for all us GPs and the whole um, healthcare system and for the patients because the patients know then that this is a person that I can get hold of and this is someone that is responsible for my care and this is someone that can advocate for me in the complex system that we have created. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Michaela, comment on that? Patient pal, I like that. Yeah. Can, we, can we start a I campaign a around that? Pal. I want a patient pal. <laughs> I think this is uh, so important what you said because empowering a patient, when a patient has an action plan or a treatment plan and this patient education, if they have uh, devices that they need to handle, that patient will also say to you, hey, don't I, do, don't I have to do my aspirometry or don't I have to do the test? But a patient who's not uh, empowered doesn't know what to do. Agree. Agree completely. Now, from a slightly different perspective, no, I think Peter has his I ha own. I have the rock. His star own version. sets. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. He has the rock <laughs> Without star the rock star, but. <laughs> so you, you can hang yeah. on to that. So Peter, you come from a slightly different point of view here. So what would your take be on this? How how do we repair, or rather not repair the system? Do we need to start over from the beginning? What do we do? Uh, yeah, we we don't have the reset the reset button, so we we need to do both at the same time, right? I, I, will, I will use two hats, right? The, the, the European Patient Safety Foundation uh, board member and also the, the, the Medtronic or the industry hat. Starting with the, with the Patient Safety Foundation, I would say that it's, it's a lot about making sure that everyone knows what we are discussing here, right? Fight fatigue is a great, a great campaign hopefully we'll be working together in it, but there is a lot more things about the well-being of health healthcare professionals mm -hmm. that are super important, not just because of everything that Nancy brilliantly showed us, but we are losing healthcare prov mm -hmm. providers and professionals every single day. So we, we cannot mm -hmm. afford. Mm -hmm. So everyone was expecting that after COVID, all the waiting lists would be starting to decline significantly recovering surgeries that is not happening and across europe what we are listing is that we cannot do that because we don't have enough healthcare pro uh, professionals so it's 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 a big issue is a big issue that if we don't take care of that well-being and it's it's about authorities governments uh, everyone but the patients also need to be aware of what is going on because ultimately it will affect us all as patients. From the other hat, from the industry hat, um, I think it's, it's a big part of what we, we try to do, sometimes with, with a bit of frustration from our side, is on the education part, is on making sure that the healthcare prof professionals know what is out there that can help them increasing uh, the level of safety for the patients. Um, and in many cases, it's a long process. That's why I was talking about frustration. I, I, I've been living that frustration all the way from sales rep uh, more than 20 years ago, where I could go to a, a, um, a purchase manager uh, that I'm pretty sure that never entered the own ICU and, and, and tell him that we could help him on uh, reducing the time that uh, nurses were spending on doing a, a given procedure. And the answer was, so that they can read more magazines? <laughs> okay, so I, I was about to kill him, but I didn't, of course. Uh, but this is still out there. It would be really, there. really bad PR. Yeah. So good <laughs> that this is still out there. There is still people working at hospitals that don't have a full idea of what is happening in that hospital. Uh, so as a company, we are also, we, we need to provide the best, the best products, of course, and patient safety is always uh, behind everything we do. But we also need to make sure the healthcare providers and healthcare professionals know exactly what they should be doing, why 
helping guidelines, helping making sure that they, they get the right education, because unfortunately they are not getting it all the time from where they should be getting, which is pretty much governments and employers. Very good point. And I know, Michaela, that you really want to comment on this when we talked about how do we increase patient safety by making it the work environment easier with using tools and mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you, first of all. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, there are digital solutions for some of it, but, but to answer something else that I was thinking of when you were talking, we are here standing as medical doctors and uh, patients. We want the same things, but it's actually the decision maker that we want to make them understand Correct. what they need. I don't know how many of them are in the room now, but that is the person we should actually reach. Like, because like you said, are they reading magazines? That shows how little they understand about the system. So I think also there has need to be system changes. I was talking to you before, Barbara, about uh, like the journal system. If I, I live in the northern part of Sweden and I get sick here in Stockholm, there has been a problem immediately because the doctor here at the ER can't read also have what my medical history. And if I'm not very well, <laughs> it's very hard for me then to say what was wrong with me. That was one. But, but I mean, there are so many things. That, but again, I think working together, that is the key. But we have to reach the right persons to influence because we can stand here and talk. We all agree what we're saying, but we are not the one to change. They are outside. And that made <laughs> such a beautiful segue on to Nancy. <laughs> but no, she has her own rock star set up. <laughs> I've got the things on. Because as you were seeing, you, you actually did take this to the policymakers. So, so do that line again. You, you actually did take this to the policymakers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. And, and it's very interesting, isn't it, that stories, individual things, you know, what is going to impact who you're talking to? So not to look at it and say, we want to say this, but think, what are you going to listen to? Uh, we've had a really brilliant um, sort of developing understanding, because this work we've done across the generations. Uh, Rue is just a consultant, and by using... Um, I'm, I'm 67, I'm a baby boomer. Long hours are good hours for us. But you look at a 35-year-old, you look at Generation X, Generation Y, they want a sensible work-life balance. They expect to be heard. Now, I'm far too nervous to go and tell one of these important politicians. There's Rue telling them. So when, what we can do is we can use different generations and different skill sets and to work in a much more collaborative way. It's this two ears and one mouth. We're not there to tell them. You know, when we've had success with politicians, we haven't gone and told them about fatigue. We've gone and asked them, would they like to hear about something that if we got it better, might mean uh, fewer people leaving and fewer errors and a more feeling of well-being. And even the Department of Health, you know, Mr. Gruffpot, they were actually quite interested. So looking, thinking, who's your audience? How do we interact? Not thinking that the doctors, the nurses, the midwives have to do it. Thinking, who's the best person to speak? And using that person. Michaela? Anything to comment or just applaud? <laughs> <laughs> applaud, and I will just say economics and quality of life. There are things that people listen to. Mm. Mm. Thank you all so much. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So we had some more ideas on how to rock this up, but we're out of time, unfortunately. So we'll take that up next year. So keep everything that you had in mind <laughs> until next year. Write it down. <laughs> and we'll get back to you in about a year. Same stage, I think, perhaps, and then we'll follow up on the discussion. Thank you so much for being here with us on stage. Yes. So there. No, it's okay. You can stay if you want. You sure? You're welcome. 
Hej! Jag heter Mattias Hellström. Jag är vd och medgrundare till Fokus Patient, vd i Citizens Affairs. Um, idag så är en allt i allo. I will do this in English as well for you guys only speaking English. So, um, you just relax for a little bit. Um, tanken är att jag ska sammanfatta dagen lite grann. Uh, och jag har tänkt mycket på att säga någonting riktigt smart om det viktiga som har varit på scenen. Men uh, jag har inte sett så mycket, tyvärr. Utan mina, alla våra argument för att få hit det med nätverkande och seminarier och paneler i världsklass. Ironiskt nog så har jag missat det mesta själv. Men vi har spelat in det så jag har en, några veckor på mig att komma i kapp här. Så det är lite skönt. Um, vi är glada och för stolta att få göra den här dagen tillsammans med eh, European Patient Safety Foundation bland annat. Eh, och ett stort tack till dem och stort tack till alla talare och panelister och andra som har gjort den här dagen till den eh, braiga dagen som jag hoppas ni tycker att det har varit, för det tycker jag. Eh, också stort tack till våra Partners och utställare. Utan dem så är inte det här möjligt. Det är vår ekonomiska basen i att kunna göra konferenser på det här sättet. Så, så ett stort tack till er också. Ett jättetack. Um, Portgeneralen säger att det är ett mingel ikväll. Glöm inte det. Västmanska palatset klockan sju. Skriver ni det? Så har jag det sagt. Uh, och alldeles snart så ska jag introducera Mirka Sikulova för er. General Manager at uh, uh, UFS, European Patient Safety Foundation in a bit after the English presentation. Um, jag hoppas att ni har haft en riktigt, riktigt bra dag idag. Att ni har verktyg att ta med er hem, nya diskussioner och jag är glad att just ni är här av anledningen att vi har våra internationella delegationer här, internationella talare och, och möjlighet att få nätverk över landsgränser. Vi har 17 nationer här i tre dagar. Så det är jättekul att just ni är här för att ta del av det här. Och göra det här till de bra äga dagarna som, som, som det kan bli. Så tack. And in English. So I'm the CEO and founder of, of uh, co-founder of Focus Patient and, and Citizens Affairs. Um, Today I've been a kind of Mr. Do-It-All and, and background worker of, of Penilla, who is the, uh, is the genius of, of these conferences. So, so we all have our, our positions and, and roles to play. I, I, I should have done a, a closing uh, session and, and got into all the good things said on stage and, and all the panelists, but unfortunately, being arranging these kinds of things, I don't really get to network and I don't really get to, to see all the, uh, uh, the good things happening on stage. So, but we have it on tape, so I will have a few weeks to, to, uh, uh, to see that and get back. So I will thank a lot of people instead. And, and uh, a big thank you to European Patient Safety Foundation who is making this possible and been helping us with speakers and, and he who is our collaboration partner and Mirka will say a few words in, in a bit. A, a big thank you to, to you and your delegation being here. Um, a big thank you to our partners, you have them here, oh, there, uh, who make this uh, possible uh, financially. Uh, we're very happy to, to work with you in, in so many levels. Uh, and now it's time for Mirka. Mirka is the general manager of uh, European Patient Safety Foundation. So welcome. And I'll leave the word with you for a bit. Any questions? No? Inga frågor i tillägg? Nej. So welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Mirka Cikelova and I'm the general manager of the European Patient Safety Foundation. And I'm so happy to be here today. Winston Churchill said, further backwards we look, further forwards we can see. So many of you don't know the story of the foundation. 
And I would like to take you back to 2013, when it all started. I am at that point working for the European Society of Anesthesiology, and I'm watching only from distance the setting up of this new foundation, with Professor Hugo van Aken being the first president. But that's not the story I want to tell you, because my journey with the foundation starts only in 2019, when I'm meeting Sven and Hugo at Zurich Airport, and we are discussing the future of the foundation. I'm not working for my previous employer anymore, and I'm, working, I'm searching for the new challenge. And Hugo would like to pass the presidency to Sven, but he is only willing to do it if I become the new general manager. I still remember Sven's doubts when we were leaving the airport about doing the right decision and accepting this difficult task. But I tell him, we will have fun. <laughs> we take our time and we spend 20, 2019 by thinking carefully about new vision, mission and strategy of the Foundation. And at the beginning of 2020, we are ready to challenge our ideas with a group of independent experts. And we are so happy about the outcome. Everyone agrees that the Foundation can bring a change by empowering people for patient safety. Patients, healthcare professionals, and best practice exchange must be at the center of all our future work. So we are so happy about telling everyone that we have these great plans for the Foundation, and then wicked virus arrives, Anus Horribili starts, and everything stops. Sven is busy, in his hospital, managing the crisis, saving his patients. I am busy at home, hiding from my children. In autumn that year, Sven is still busy in the hospital, exhausted by yet another COVID wave, and the oxygen levels of the foundation are very similar to the oxygen levels of his patients in the intensive care unit. We must act. So I spent long hours on video calls, talking with representatives of different patient organizations, European associations, discussing with them patient safety in Europe and the place of the foundation. And we start beginning 2021 with first brave affiliates joining the foundation. And Focus Patient is one of them. We are slowly recovering from the crisis rebuilding the team, starting working on new projects. The working atmosphere with our board members is great. And by the end of the year, we are really proud to see the fruits of all our, all our work. We have nurses, patient representatives, national organizations, universities, hospitals, and very strong industry partners on board. And here we are now in 2022, and I think from my story, you can understand how happy and proud I am here to be in Stockholm together with Sven, with Penilla, with all our board members who could you, you could hear today telling you the story of our foundation. Thank you, Sven, for all the work you have done. Thank you for the last three years of leadership of this foundation. Thanks to your dedication, enthusiasm, and patience, we are where we stand now. A strong, solid, and sustainable foundation that is ready to grow, develop new partnerships, and enlarge our network. And thank you as well for your trust in me, because we did have fun. As the old African proverb says, it needs the whole village to raise a child. We in the foundation, we are aware that we can raise this foundation only if we collaborate closely with local and national actors that are working hard every day for improving safety and of their patients and of their healthcare system. 
the foundation exists because of you. And you are the future of the foundation. Future where we empower patients and healthcare professionals for their well-being and safety. And as we look to our future, I would like to welcome the new president of the European Patient Safety Foundation, Penilla Ganter. Well, it, it's, uh, it's really an honor to, to stand here today, and uh, it's also some kind of precious one <laughs> to be your successor here in, in this uh, very important task, I think, because patient safety is not only for patients to care about, it's for all of us to care about. And together, as Mirka said, we can do it. And that's why we really would love to have another conference again, talking about these issues from all these different perspectives. And I am sure about that you have had some networking done today, and you can bring home some some new things to think about about patient safety, whether you are in a company, you're working in healthcare, or if you are a patient representative. So thank you so much. And I also think it will be great fun to work with you, Mirka. And um, of course, we welcome also new members. So if you haven't talked to Mirka before, she will be here for the next two days as well. Um, we welcome new members to the foundation. So if you care about patient safety, you should really become a member or affiliate member of, of the foundation. And uh, we will celebrate with Sven tonight <laughs> and all of you, I hope. You're very welcome to this networking event at Westmanska Palatset. It's just a, um, a few, it's not even a block from here. It's uh, Valingatan 2, Valin Street number 2. So it's just across the Drottninggatan, and you'll be there. So at 7 o'clock, Matthias? Sharp, 7 o'clock sharp. Yeah. We will be there. We will be there. We hope that, uh, that you guys will be there as well. It's going to be a finalization of the day. Uh, I think we have one thing more, though. We have Mirka. So I would like to business. give a little present. Oh. One is for Penilla, because she will have a hard task in managing our board. So she's well equipped now. <laughs> Yeah. I think that she will use this one in the office, so this will not be a, a useful thing, I, I, I think. And we have used. one also for Sven, but this one can't move anymore, so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, uh, thank you for being here today. And I hope I'll see you, some of you at least tomorrow. And uh, if you're not attending the networking event tonight, I hope we'll ha you will have a safe trip home or wherever you go. And uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but I must have the last word. <laughs> First of all, thank you for this wonderful conference. And um, yesterday I already said, <laughs> you are used to it. You are used to it. You know the Swiss are love to cry in public. <laughs> um, thank you to Mirka. Uh, it's, it's been oof, really a great time. <laughs> and we had a lot, of, <clears throat> we had a, really a lot of fun. And um, sometimes we had um, not that much money. <laughs> but I must say congratulations to you, Penilla, um, for the new post. And um, you did not know that this was an experiment. 
um, because we thought by ourselves, will she be really the, uh, be the best um, choice for being the next president of the foundation? And we said, oh, let's organize a conference and uh, let's, um, let's have her organize it. And I think after um, having this day, uh, we realized um, you and your team you did a perfect job. And I think you together with the team of Mirka and the board will also do a perfect job. So I'm very much looking forward. And today in the morning, I, I um, said to her, good morning, Mrs. President. And she said, no, 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 I don't like this. Um, everybody calls me the queen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, Queen Penilla the first as a new president. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you.